Well, it's certainly, while they're getting set up here, it's certainly a privilege to be here. Uh, we, my wife and I had the privilege of being at a TED Med conference in, uh, right before the holidays, and I think we've absolutely captured the passion and the diversity of thinking uh, here at UNC, and it's really exciting. Um, so uh, congratulations to everybody. Um, when I first started my career, I, uh, this is, many of you were just born about that time, so it's the early 1990s. I got invited to join a, be part of an innovation team at a very large chemical company in Europe. And I got a chance to go, they, you know, all expenses paid, fly out there. And the team met in a room that looked just like this, a little sterile. And it was filled, those chairs were filled not only with all white guys, but they all graduated from the same two groups in Europe. They all knew exactly the same stuff. And I felt front and center at that point that this group was structurally unable to be innovative. They have set themselves up in sort of a deficit to be innovative because they all knew the same things. And it's quite clear that we learn the most from those that we have the least in common with. And when you end up surrounding yourself with, with people that know exactly what you know, you're at a disadvantage in the innovation process. This is from Scott, Scott Page's book, The Difference, which is a terrific uh, read about this uh, topic. The fact is diversity produces massive benefits in the innovation process. Scott talked about this fundamental insight that in problem solving, diversity is powerful stuff. It doesn't always trump ability, but it does so far more often we, than we'd expect. Does this thinking mean that we should abandon the meritocracy? Of course not. Ability matters. But the point is, so does diversity. It's a powerful combination to bring together people from a very broad perspective in any sort of innovation engine that you're trying to be part of. And I encourage you all to think about that as you set up the teams that you all will be part of or are part of today. This is a, a snapshot of a couple of teams that I'm associated with in my research group uh, here at UNC, also involving students at NC State, um, and also our team at Liquidia, which is a spin-out company that's located off Davis Drive in Research Triangle Park. And we have purposefully organized these teams to embrace a wide range of thinking that we hand select people uh, for embracing different types of disciplines, different cultural backgrounds, different ways of thinking about problems. And we do this in order to have a broad perspective. I get very uneasy when there's consensus around the table. And I purposely make sure that we try to have a diverse range of thinking in order to make our ideas uh, better. And this is kind of like coaching a, a basketball team, if you will. I, you know, I think we're, we're a Sweet 16 team. I'm not sure we're an elite, an elite eight or a Final Four team. It takes a massive amount of effort in order to take a, verse, a diverse set of team, but then to have them focus and, in, fa in fact, be one in problem solving. But I actually think it's our competitive advantage and I want to show you some examples of taking diversity and ironically using it to address different problems in sort of a unifying way. So let me give you some examples of this type of diverse thinking and I'll do this with a couple of vignettes in problem solving that we have focused on and one is, is pancreatic cancer. 
This is a paper that appeared in Science not too long ago that talked about the challenges with pancreatic cancer. And this was by some researchers, uh, David Tubison uh, in the UK, who recognized that cancer cells in pancreatic cancer cells actually surround themselves with what he called in his paper a fortress. Do you know that pancreatic cancer is now known that when people die from it, that that tumor actually started 21 years earlier. And it's a very slow growing cancer. It doesn't present itself to very late in the disease cycle and it's often uh, too late to do anything about it. But those cancer cells actually are very susceptible to drugs. The problem is they're surrounded by this fortress. It's a very slow growing tumor. Now those of you that are a little bit queasy, you may not want to glance at this next uh, image. Uh, but this is a picture of pancreatic uh, cancer tumors. I won't leave that up there very long. But actually the tumors are as white as your eyeball, which is really unusual because if you deal with tumors, they're often rich with a blood supply. A process called angiogenesis brings a lot of blood to tumors and they grow very quickly. Pancreatic cancers do not. They're slow growing, they're, bl they're blocked access to drugs. Your blood system is the highway with which we deliver drugs. So hold that thought. And you think about the diversity of experiences that one can bring to the innovation process. Let me tell you about how a solution to pancreatic cancer may be emerging in our lab and what got us to thinking about that. I had the good fortune to be part of a design team led by a professor from Duke, Richard Stack. It wasn't basketball season, so it was okay to work with him. <laughs> and we developed a fully bioabsorbable drug-eluting stent a coronary heart stent that would go away after 18 months. Most stents are metal, they're in you for your lifetime, and we developed a plastic-based stent that would go away in about 18 months. And the thought was that the body would heal itself, so why have a permanent prosthetic to a temporary healing issue? And what I learned about this field, this field's called interventional cardiology. Cardiologists, interventional cardiologists, use catheters, come through the femoral artery in your thigh, and can put this device anywhere in the body. We could deliver this device, and it was drug eluding. And I became enamored with the ability of locally delivering drugs. Hold that thought, switch topics. This was a collaboration with a company called iGate, and it was to develop drugs that would treat eye disease, in particular wet macular degeneration, to put drugs deep into the eye using a non-invasive approach. A mild electric current would be placed on the eye with a device that would sit on the eye, and you'd run it for a few minutes and you could put drugs deep into the eye. Using electric field assisted delivery to an organ that's poorly vascularized like your eyeball. So we became enamored with the ability of using devices, catheter-based devices, and electric fields to drive drugs where there isn't a highway, that we can use an electric field-assisted approach. And so we thought we could merge all these different concepts and develop what we're calling interventional oncology, just like interventional cardiology. And so our team here at UNC and Duke includes surgeons, Jen Jen Ye in the School of Medicine, Richard Stack, the guy we did the bioabsorbable stent with, folks in the School of Pharmacy, and we've put together an interdisciplinary team with guidance from the Food and Drug Administration on how to develop a new therapy that would address this disease. You know, there's 50,000 people a year that come up they're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and there's about 50,000 people a year that die from pancreatic cancer. There has been no effective solution. So we've developed devices that are in fact able to surround the pancreas 
and this is an example of a device shown here, that we're able to implant using a minimally invasive surgical procedure, like a laparoscopic procedure. And what we find is that we can put 60 times more drug into this tumor, 60, than one can get by an IV. Most people in drug design are happy if you can get a 20% improvement, 20%. This is 60 times a massive increase in the localized drug where normally there's a fortress around these cancer cells. And the key is none of this drug is found circulating in the body systemically. It's a huge increase in local or focal delivery of drugs directly uh, into the pancreas. And we've been able to now do this in a way that is showing efficacy in the mouse models of human disease. And so it's this diversity of thinking that's brought together interventional cardiologists to bring together approaches to cancer with medical device design and pharmaceutical sciences along with new drugs. And so we're pretty excited about combining these things in a new innovative approach. That's a, that's a you know, it's hard to find another research team that has that range of perspectives going forward. Let me give you another example. We're enamored with the manufacturing techniques used in the computer industry to generate the integrated circuits that are all in our cell phones and our computers used to make transistors. And we think there's a massive opportunity for harnessing the fabrication techniques used to make computer chips in order to make better medicines and vaccines. And it's bridging two very different fields. When you go to meetings with electronicers that do semiconductor research, you can't find very much biology in those talks or in those meetings. And if you go into a clinic, clinical meeting of, in biology and cancer research or vaccine research, you don't see the breadth of experience or a different way of thinking that one finds in a semiconductor industry. And so we're trying to bridge those two. And I had a wonderful chance to speak with Bill Gates about a year ago, a year and a half ago now. And I knew I would have the 10 second opportunity to say hello to Bill. And I thought for months ahead of time what I was gonna to say to him. And upon meeting him, it was Joe, this is Bill, Bill, this is Joe. Bill said, you know, what do you do? I said, Bill, we're using manufacturing techniques of the computer industry to make new vaccines. That's an elevator speech that grabbed Microsoft and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in a very tangible way, not just a financial way. And so let me tell you about that story. <clears throat> this is a movie clip from our company, Liquidia, that is able to take and harness the manufacturing techniques used to make computer chips. And ironically, now we've molded it, we folded it into the roll-to-roll -roll techniques of the film industry. Remember Kodak and Polaroid used to have film cameras? We use these film techniques to make very precise particles that are useful in the design of new medicines and new vaccines. Again, bridging, very disparate. You know, phone, the film industry is now kaput. But we now find new life for it by using semiconductor processing to make new medicines and new vaccines. And so these are examples of particles that we fabricate that have very precise sizes and shapes. And what we're able to do with these sizes and shapes is begin exploring how they interface with live cells and in your body. No one prior to this has been able to control the size and shape of particles. And we're able to do that, and these are alveolar macrophages on the lower level. These are the cells that in your airway protect us from particulates and pathogens. And we get to see that they enter cells by a wide range of new mechanisms that we've not been able to study before. These are ovarian cancer cells that our particles are able to get inside the cells. And now we know from biology teams that the chemistry within a cancer cell is different than chemistry in other cells, and we can exploit that to design what we think are Trojan horse bombs 
that can release chemotherapy agents inside those cells and kill those cells. So this is now targeted chemotherapy agents. They're able to dump drugs inside specific cells as opposed to dumping drugs all throughout your body. Imaging techniques have allowed us to identify cancers earlier and earlier when they're still localized. But many of our therapies are systemic. The opportunity for targeted delivery is immense. Going beyond cancer, there are great opportunities for designing things like synthetic blood. This is an image of our particles that were designed to take advantage of, the, of how blood cells operate. The same size and same shape, and they are as, as elastic as our real red blood cells. So here we're grabbing a mechanical engineering, electrical engineering processing, understanding blood banks, understanding the importance of blood transfusions. If you have sickle cell disease, after multiple transfusions, you can have an immunological response to blood transfusions, which is tragic. We can now make blood that might not be immunogenic and can alleviate some of the issues associated with that. And we now have hemoglobin loaded up into synthetic red blood cell mimics. But the story I want to tell you about is one that actually we heard a little bit earlier about the opportunity for global access. Vaccines are one of the most important opportunities for addressing world needs. Vaccines address pathogens. This is an image of a couple of different types of pathogens, one viral, one bacterial. Early generations of vaccine design, as I've learned from my immunology friends, involve giving people live attenuated whole pathogens. People would inject the original pathogen, partially kill it, but inject that in your body and you would elicit an immune response. It's a powerful vaccine. The challenge is it has safety issues because it's the whole pathogen. You could have, you could get the disease and that's not good from a safety point of view. So everyone has evolved from whole pathogens, live attenuated whole pathogens, to what are called subunit vaccines. Strip off some of the molecules off the surface of a virus and just give them those, give people those as a vaccine. Or maybe strip off a molecule off the flagella of a bacterium. Your body recognizes those molecules. Your innate immune system will recognize those molecules. And you can elicit an immune response but it's not quite as robust as getting the live attenuated whole pathogen. So what we're able to do now is combine this. We're able to make mimics of real pathogens because we can control sizes and shapes. And we can now decorate the surface of them with the subunit vaccines. And we've now moved this into the clinic. This is our first product. It was an influenza vaccine. And it involved taking our particles shown in the lower left these particles are made out of the same material as a bioabsorbable suture. It's been in the clinic in a lot of different products. It will just dissolve, just like our bioabsorbable stent did. But now we make nanoparticles out of it. And what we do, and that's what's in those, lower, those, those jars on the upper left are our particles, you simply cannulate in the standard influenza vaccine that you and I get into our jars with these nanoparticles, and we get a 12-fold improvement in antibody response. Because we now trick the immune system to thinking it's closer to the pathogen than just the molecules and we have a massively increased response. And this is the team, a very diverse team, that brought this work to the clinic. Unfortunately, we still have to process a lot of paperwork and we killed a tree or two, uh, but that's all the paperwork to get a product into the clinic. So we're excited about this vaccine design, but let me tell you the one I'm most excited about and the one that got Bill Gates most excited about. Lipitor, as many of you heard, just came, just came off patent. And now that it's off patent, the biggest pharmaceutical product in the world is a vaccine called Prevnar. It's given to every child in the developed world, and it involves combining these molecules in a very expensive way that leaves, uh, leads to a very expensive product. We're able to use our print process to deliver those products. And we now have the ability of delivering this vaccine, which is normally a four-dose sequence, 
at $90 a dose, that costs $21 a dose, that no one in the developing world can use because it's too expensive. It looks like we can do it now in a single dose with a cost that might be less than a dollar a dose. So the opportunity using advances in technology to actually drive down costs, we think is a great opportunity. So let me end there. I think the opportunities of bridging a range of disciplines, especially the microelectronics manufacturing, that has now reached a, such a great point in applying it to addressing a, a wide range of new opportunities. And we're really grateful for the financial support. As I say, vision without resources is indeed a hallucination. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs>